Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar on 89.7. Tonight, Elizabeth Freeman. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. Once she was free, she chose her own name, Elizabeth Freeman. But as an enslaved woman living in Massachusetts, she was called Mum Bet or Bet. In a bold act of resistance, Freeman went to court and won, the first African-American woman to win a freedom suit. It was 1781, one year after the creation of the state's 1780 constitution, which declared slavery illegal in the Commonwealth. During this Black History Month, a tribute to a woman whose remarkable story has been largely unknown, Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman. Joining us remotely, Lamurchie Frazier, a visual activist and director of education for the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. Sophia Hall is the Deputy Litigation Director for Lawyers for Civil Rights in Boston. And Kira Singleton, Executive Director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford. Welcome to all of you. I'm starting, with, I'm starting with you, Kira, because I want to set the environment by which Elizabeth uh, Freeman Mumbet story came to be. So the environment was early on, even before she decided to file a lawsuit, there had been one guy who filed a suit in Massachusetts. This is pre-Massachusetts Constitution. Tell us about him. Yeah, so um, I think what's really important about Elizabeth Freeman is that she is emerging um, within a community of uh, free and enslaved Black people who have been consistently challenging um, uh, the courts in order to bring about uh, legal abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So early on, at the beginning of the 18th century, we know that there's a man named Adam who actually sues uh, for his freedom and in 1701, and then he's awarded his freedom in 1703, and that becomes the basis of the first anti-slavery pamphlet in Massachusetts. And then right, you know, and that's all the way at the beginning of the 18th century. Um, then you get to a few years right before Elizabeth Freeman launches her case, and there are several um, uh, freedom suits that are usually done in groups. Groups of Black men actually usually petition. They almost always fail. Um, however, it's building up the case for legal precedence. So then by the time we actually get to Elizabeth Freeman, mm -hmm. she's, a, she's successful. Um, and then right after that, you have Quack Walker um, uh, that leads to uh, the eventual um, uh, abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. Okay. So one thing to make clear is that uh, for Elizabeth Freeman, some of those cases, people were asking for very specific kinds of damages. But Elizabeth yes. Freeman was arguing, hey, this whole thing is wrong. I should have my whole personhood. That's what I want back, my humanity. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, so uh, Sophia, you raised something that I thought was so interesting that we have fixed in our minds this narrative uh, that is different for the North and the South vis-a-vis -vis what slavery is. Like we think about Massachusetts in the North and isn't this all abolitionist state? But in fact, um, we're carrying in our mind uh, the, the Southern narrative of what slavery was about. So it's hard to imagine that there even could be people petitioning for their uh, rights and through legal means. Uh, talk about why that was so important, going the legal route. Absolutely. And so you sort of hit the nail on the head here, which is that you know, there is an oversharing through our school system for young people about the Underground Railroad right, and about many major players in the, the right to emancipation, but we don't hear about the, the use of jurisprudence as a means of freedom. And in addition, even if we happen to hear about it and we talk about that narrative, we don't talk about it from the point of view of the enslaved person who was an active participant in that type of advocacy. So, I mean, it's really startling for anyone that is watching the show today and just isn't familiar, a freedom lawsuit, which is what we're talking about here for Ms. Freeman, is a means of asserting a legal claim to seek freedom, 
right? So it's bringing a case to court and saying the remedy or the, the outcome that I want is for you to free my personhood. And they're fairly common in some parts of the country, but more so in the 1800s. So we see a lot of them between 1800 and 1850 before most people know about Dred Scott in the 1850s, but there are quite a few of them in the early 1800s in Missouri. And when people think about how do you use jurisprudence to gain freedom, you know, there were some really creative legal arguments. Historically, the, the beginning was to say, well, I'm not a black person, thus I should be free, right? I might have a drop of white or a parent that is a white person or a Native American, and thus I don't qualify as a black person who should be enslaved. Um, and then we see sort of the evolution of this litigation to take into consideration rights that are given through various states. So Missouri is a hotbed in the 1800s because Missouri recognizes that if you come through a free state, even if you land in a state where they have slavery, that transit through, which is kind of modern day commerce clause, is a right to freedom, to your personhood. So Missouri has a ton of freedom lawsuits in the 1800 using that legal analysis. Miss Freeman is basically the on the beginning of that precipice, not only because this is in the 1700s, but also because she is using uh, she is using a conversation through a constitution that's so new that's newer than what the country yeah. has had, right? Um, to to create jurisprudence, to create a legal argument, and like so many impact lawyers like myself, she's basically saying, "Hey, modern day world, our our values, our norms, the way the world functions needs to follow our laws, and right. our laws say I'm free." All right, so now we got the setting. So here we are, Lamurchi, and yeah. what makes Elizabeth Freeman, Mum Betts' story so powerful is that she was an enslaved woman who could not read or write. And the way to her freedom was her overhearing what was going on in the household of the people who enslaved her. And what was going on, Lamurchi, was that they were talking about their freedom from Britain. Yes. And we're talking about that. Talk about it, please. Okay, so based on Mombet serving men who are act actually drafting the Declaration of Independence of Sheffield, uh, which would have been a, a municipal document, um, that declaration would apply to the men and those who were like them in that room in the clause of all born free and equal. Mom Bet is serving them. She hears this. She stores it away. And she says, well, when she's accosted by Mrs. Ashley in the home where she is in servitude. She was in the home of Colonel okay. John Ashley. Go ahead. Colonel John Ashley is where she, she had been purchased by him uh, when she was a child and had served him up until she was almost 40 years old. And in that household, she, her sister, and her daughter were dwelling when uh, Mrs. Ashley gave a command to her, her sister. She disobeyed. She took a hot iron out of the fire to strike her. Mumbet intervened and had a mark on her for the rest of her life. It is at that moment the phrase all born free and equal is pushing her to not only dismiss herself from this household and run away, but she also then asks a anti-slavery lawyer, Theodore Cedric, who has been meeting to draft that document um, on the basis of all born free and equal, aren't I to be free? So he then reluctantly takes the case. Theodore Cedric is one who has already um, been found to have a bill of sale of a Negro uh, servant, Negro woman servant in 1777. So there's this also this tension that is there uh, between slavery and freedom and those who are um, uh, engaging in this practice to be trusted. Uh, but mom bet Elizabeth Freeman is aware of who these people are. Well, and on the basis of that, she's able to uh, ask him to represent her case. So Lamurchi, they thought she was just, you know, a piece of the furniture, really. Here's what she heard yeah. that turned her around. Resolved that mankind in a state of nature are equal, free, and independent of each other and have a right to the undisturbed enjoyment of their lives, their liberty, and property. And yeah. so she thought, well, why wouldn't that apply to me? And, yeah. and from there, took it on.
Let me yes, just sir. underscore something you said about Theodore Sedgwick, because um, uh, Kira is nodding her head and she needs to pick up on this. And that is, he had enslaved people in his service. So she went to a lawyer, this is the tension in Massachusetts, um, who is helping to write these resolves, write these words, not thinking about her, employs or doesn't employ, um, quote unquote, owns uh, enslaved persons, Kira, but yet takes the case. Yes. So, I mean, I think that it allows us to get at, um, you know, the tension between slavery and freedom and to, to you know, to really unpack, you know, what happens even, you know, afterwards, that, there, that's, that no one um, in Massachusetts is completely free of uh, engaging in slavery. You know, either uh, people are enslavers themselves, either they hire out um, uh, servants who are enslaved to other people. They're directly profiting from the money that is coming into Massachusetts because of the slave trade. And so that tension to me, um, you know, allows us to talk about how prominent slavery was and how people often ha have contradictory ideals, right? That one could have enslaved people in their service and still take on this case because for them, that is a political uh, challenge. And if successful, that's going to, that's going to advance, um, their own political goals and ideals. Um, and so I think that, that that tension is really important. And I think the tension afterwards is, is even more important that, you know, Elizabeth Freeman, she gains her Freeman and then she essentially works in domestic labor, you know, for uh, that family. And there's not, she's doing the same thing that she was doing um, when she was enslaved. The only difference is, is that now she has her freedom. Um, and so that tension is there as well. What opportunities are, you know, are available for free um, black people, you know, because racism doesn't exist. Uh, uh, it doesn't go away. Segregation doesn't go away in Massachusetts. It's all still there, even though slavery technically ends. So it's unclear to me whether or not Theodore Cedric got uh, or let go or made free the other enslaved people in his service. But as Mumbet was working for him, or at that point she was Elizabeth Freeman working for him, she worked for him till she, you know, when she died after, actually, yeah. they buried her in the family plot. She's right next to him in the family plot. So that was interesting. But her story after she got free, she moved, bought land in Massachusetts and you know, lived her life. Why is it we don't know this story, Lamurchi? You didn't know this story, I didn't know this story, Sophia didn't know this story, Kira knew it, but I didn't know it. I, well, I knew this story. I've been telling this story for uh, about uh, 15 years at the Museum of African American History because it marks that line between the end of the beginning of slavery in Massachusetts by the Body of Liberties adopted in 1641, that amendment to it in 1646 that allows for the petition uh, of freedom. And then the end of slavery in 1783. Okay. Her case is really critical to that conversation. So you can't leave it out. Uh, when, when we talk about her being one of the first women in Massachusetts to own property, that is significant to her also being one of the first women to have a will. And when we're talking about this, we look at what Sophia has offered in terms of jurisprudence. This is an establishment of the legal system and the use and occupation of that legal system by those who are enslaved. And so as we look at Mombet's case, we are able to see that she was a woman not only listening and paying attention, but she was a woman of integrity, of honesty, and, and a pursuant person in the public light of liberation and freedom. She's using this apparatus to really get free because slavery was a contract. Yeah. Slavery, you know, in most cases- A was commercial that, contract. A commercial contract, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this idea of property becomes paramount to being able to levy, leverage one's personhood as an active and productive person in the, in the uh, Massachusetts Commonwealth. So as we look at her av availability of thinking and applying herself, it is said that she was indeed a very fine servant, but she was never servile mm. because mm. in her sphere, as uh, Catherine Sedgwick 
speaks of her in like 1853 when she's writing about Mombet. She is speaking to a woman who was superior in her sphere. Okay. None could match her. Sophia, what so. does it know? So you and I are the only people that didn't know. So uh, <laughs> to be clear in this conversation, um, you know, wh what does her story mean to you? Well, so let me say two things. You know, hopefully there's more people than just me and you, Kelly. Okay. And hopefully today's show is going to change that. <laughs> but, you know, what it strikes for me is two things. Modern day, our narratives are still not dominated by anyone, unfortunately, sometimes, but the white majority voice. And that is changing. That's obviously changing by the young ladies that are here with us today, but that may not still be the majority. And so part of why we don't learn these things in school, why they're not written about in history books is because Black voices and Black decision-making doesn't necessarily go into the development of that uh, curriculum or those textbooks, right? And that's a problem. The other piece of the story that none of us seem to know, I imagine even maybe Kyrie Lamerchi don't know, is what's the story of Miss Freeman prior to her lawsuit, right? We don't know what year she was born. We don't know for sure if she has children, if she was married, if she has siblings. We don't know what state she was born in. We don't know her favorite color or what her passions were and what else she may have brought to this world. And I think as we celebrate Black History Month, one of the really important things for us to always keep in mind is that we are celebrating sometimes the absence of our stories mm -hmm. because we are erased from history. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, as we're digging out some of this history, as we're learning it, and as we are capturing it and sharing it through museums, through catalog, um, it's still unfortunately heartbreaking because there's so much that is still lost and may always be lost. So Kara, you're at the Royal House and it's your job to really look at um, the whole, the, the enslavement as it, mm -hmm. uh, existed here in Massachusetts and think about all some of the people who are involved in it. So how do you see Elizabeth Freeman in this? And, and, and what, because you did know about her, what um, mm -hmm. strikes you that other, others of us should take away, particularly in this Black, Black History Month? Well, I think for me, the most important part is that, you know, Elizabeth Freeman is in a long line of Black women who have always utilized the courts to advocate on behalf of themselves, to advocate for other Black communities, um, and to define freedom on their own terms. And I think, you know, we talk about that as a 19th century story, but really it's an 18th century story. And you have people like Elizabeth Freeman, people like Belinda Sutton, who are really, really, you know, pushing us to really think about the ways in which Black women in particular have been at the forefront of um, abolitionist movements. We too often talk about the story of abolitionism through, you know, white lawyers and judges or through Black men. And then what happens is that Black women are mm -hmm. often erased race because they're not their stories are not often you know taught through kind of the ways in which they're utilizing the law. They're not taught through the ways in which Black women become property owners. And then the other part of it is to then not say that we need to just uh, know who people like Elizabeth Freeman, you know, are. We do, but we also need to understand that we cannot talk about any type of social movement without thinking about the role of Black women, that they've always been a part of it. So, you know, I think for me um, in doing this work, it's not not only to think about how history can be reparative, what we can learn that we don't know, but also to really think about how history has always been transformed through the actions of Black women in particular. Um, Lamerchi, I just note, and I guess all of you would note it too, that she chose Freeman as her mm -hmm. last name. Yes. I guess it would be odd to be free woman, but Freeman speaks to what she thought of herself and what she was going for and what her mission was. I mean, Absolutely. it's pretty powerful. Yes, it is. Her, she announces her status as her name is changed. That court case is pivotal uh, to her life as an independent and free woman. When she purchased property, that name, Freeman, as a free person, is on that deed. And as she then establishes herself in her will, we find that there significantly, she is paying attention to who she's leaving her money to in her will and how this continuum of people that Kara speaks to has then even produced a W.E.B. Du Bois, who is her 
grand, her great grandson, that this is not accidental, that this is a planful, intentional act of hers to then establish a, a, uh, this integral part of what it means to be free. She has been a midwife. In, a, in addition to her domestic service. But what that case does, in addition to her declaring her identity as a free woman, it also allows her to be able to co collect compensation for her labor and then amass enough money. It wasn't magical. She amassed and earned enough money to purchase property, to pay back Dero Cedric for her, for her defense and then leave money. So this act of hers has so many ramifications across uh, boundaries and networks of the states that are here in New England. And then for those that are in the South that catch up later to this kind of thinking in terms of being able to do it, not that they weren't thinking it at all, mm -hmm. but there's the actions that are proven and uh, documented by her, by her case, are very important to us understanding what freedom really is and what those lines of demarcation become. Sophia, um, Freeman, in today's world, how do you see it? And how do you see Elizabeth claiming her status? How are we claiming our status? I mean, you know, as a civil rights lawyer right here in Boston, Massachusetts, every single one of my clients is a Freeman, right? Every single time they come forward with the being the first person to push jurisprudence just a little bit further, every time they stand up against a police department and say that this was unjust, that this was excessive force, every time we talk about changing employment practices that are systematically like drawing out people of color from promotions, from access, uh, from fair discipline, you know, every single one person that I work for is a Freeman. Mm -hmm. Kira, same question to you. Hmm. I mean, it's a very good question. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, for me, one of the things that I often think about um, and doing this work is that, you know, we have to be as attuned to Black people's freedom dreams in the past as we are to them today. Um, and I think, you know, Elizabeth Freeman's, you know, story can, you know, allow us to imagine what a more just future looks like, right? And so it's understanding the past and how the past impacts are, are, are present, but also what we can imagine um, a just future can look like and being very intentional that we can make that for ourselves. Um, and I think Elizabeth Freeman was doing that. And one of the things I, I, I feel very passionate about is that, you know, we often talk about her in relation to um, the revolution Revolutionary War, um, which is very, very important. And I think one of the things that Lemurchi really brought out that I just want to highlight again is that, you know, Black people had always been talking about freedom and they always been trying to define it. You can find all of these court cases in which if, if someone was enslaved, they're also going to the courts. And I just think it's really important um, today to have that knowledge and to have that um, be as widespread as possible because I think we don't always have to think about um, our history through a lens of um, impossibility, but there was always, you know, possibility. Um, and Elizabeth Freeman is an exemplar of that. Where would you put her on the spectrum? You know, some of the names we may know, like a Rosa Parks later on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where, where, where would you put uh, Elizabeth Freeman? On a I scale think of be, one to ten. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you say, uh, Lamarchi? I was gonna say on a scale of one to ten and eleven. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Kira, you were saying? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I think she has to be right there, right? Like she has to be, we we should know as much about her as we do know about Rosa Parks, or we do know about Harriet Tubman, or we do know about Sojourner Truth. And I think once Massachusetts decides to really reckon with their history with slavery, um, we'll start to understand, um, you know, more about people like Elizabeth Freeman, that how do we even get to Rosa Parks without talking about who came before, you know? And so we have to have, we have to, we should be calling her name in the same breath. Sophia. I mean, it's hard to add to that, right? Absolutely agree. And what I hope is that today's show does exactly that for us, at least one step in the right direction. Uh, you know, uh, one last note from all of you. There are people listening to this for the first time, understanding that they're 
was slavery in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get mm -hmm. their minds around that and mm -hmm. then jump to a, an enslaved woman who went to court who could not read or write and won. <laughs> so that's just like a remarkable, amazing story. This mm -hmm. is black history and American history. And mm -hmm. as Kira has said, Lamurchie, Massachusetts history. Yes, it is. Uh, just want to say that she didn't have reading and writing as one of her lit literacies or two of her literacies, but she had a different kind of literacy. She was uh, extremely brilliant and intelligent. And uh, uh, Catherine Cedric talks about her intelligence and how she applied it to everything she did. So when we think about this as a part of what um, Kira referred to as reparative. This narrative of reparative uh, justice becomes our focus rather than the paranoia of what's been the blame game and all of that. Uh, we have to focus on women who were triumphant like Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabeth Freeman. Well, that is a great place to end this conversation. Thank you all for adding so much to the story of Elizabeth Mumbet Freedom. Uh, that's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thank you all for joining us. Good night.